Today's topic is Latin America between World War I and now. We will discuss it in three sections chronologically. First, 1914 to 1945, the two world wars and the years between. Second, 1945 to 1990 or the Cold War years. And third, 1990 to the present. Specifically, we will discuss Latin American relations with the world, Latin American relations with the United States, and examine Cuba, Argentina, Argentina and Chile. Between 1914 and 1945, the world was engulfed in two world wars and the Great Depression. So where does Latin America fit into this narrative? During World War I, Latin America managed to remain neutral throughout the conflict, with the exception of Brazil, who declared war against Germany shortly after the U.S. did in 1917. However, the disruption of trade hurt Latin American countries, as they could not trade with Europe at the time. The Great Depression hurt Latin America as much as any region, particularly as the U.S. and European markets became virtually closed, middle-class Latinos broke with political elites and governments that failed to control the damage. Instead, eight Latin American nations between 1929 and 1933 attempted military takeovers. Both military and civilian governments attempted to industrialize. They attempted to produce their own goods so as not to have to import them. Both Hitler and Mussolini took interest in Latin America, particularly as some Latin American leaders adopted fascist and Nazi ideologies and political parties. But when war broke out in 1939, Latin America worried about invasions from Germany. French, Dutch, and Danish colonies in the West Indies and South America might become bases for Germany. The Latin American countries gave the U.S. authorization to establish a protectorate over those colonies. After the U.S. entered the war in 1941, Latin America cooperated with the United States. In 1944, Mexico sent uh, fighter pilots to the Philippines and 250,000 Mexicans enlisted in the U.S. military. Tens of thousand braceros or immigrant workers came to the U.S. to work in our factories to support the war. Panama worked with the U.S. to protect the canal and Chile supplied valuable minerals. Brazil gave the U.S. land for an air base in the South Atlantic, uh, one, 1,900 miles from West Africa. They also supplied the Allies with rubber. Brazilian submarines also patrolled the Atlantic and Caribbean, allowing the U.S. submarines to fight against Japan. In contrast, the Argentine army overthrew its civilian government in 1943 to keep it from declaring war on Germany, but remained neutral until 1945, when it declared war on Germany and Japan to qualify for membership in the United Nations. The relationship between the US and Latin America has always been akin to a frenemy. For two centuries, the United States and Latin America have had a tumultuous relationship. In 1823, the Monroe Doctrine committed the US to defend Latin American countries against efforts by the Europeans to recolonize. There are few relations until after the Civil War when the US started commercial endeavors with its Southern neighbors. As previously discussed, the US became involved in the Spanish-American War in the 1890s due to its sympathies toward Cuba. The, def the defeat of Spain started the US imperialism of Guam and Puerto Rico. Cuba, although independent, found itself subject to the US intervention due to the Platt Amendment. In 1904, President Theodore Roosevelt expanded on it by passing the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, giving the United States power to intervene in the entire Caribbean basin. Between 1901 and 1928, the U.S. military intervened in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean 50 times. This was known as gunboat diplomacy. Theodore Roosevelt's distant cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, changed U.S. policy when he was president between 1933 and 1945. Latin America's support for the U.S. during World War II seemed to solidify the, quote, good neighbor policy 
but the Cold War would change that relationship. At first, Latin America played a minor role in the Cold War. Most Latin American nations were neutral or fearful to oppose the U.S. openly. Others supported the U.S. by membership in the OAS, or the Organization of American States. However, as this map demonstrates, the U.S. intervened in Latin America many times under the policy of containment. In 1959, it took center stage in Cuba. As previously discussed, the Cuban Revolution, in which Fidel Castro came to power, imposing a brutal dictatorship on his people and taking over U.S. businesses and industries in Cuba, set the path to the Bay of Pigs invasion and the Cuban Missile Crisis. By the 1930s, the Argentinian democratic government had alienated its base of working class supporters. It paved the way for a military coup, and by 1945, Juan Perón emerged as the nation's leader. Perón built a power base with the working classes. Descamisados, or manual laborers, made up the majority of his supporters. His wife, Eva, was a popular actress and radical. She was so popular, six million Argentinians called for her canonization when she died in 1952. He was ousted from power in 1955 due to poor management of the economy. He was exiled to Spain. With Perón gone, Argentina suffered from a series of military dictatorships and terrorist groups who rallied against them. In 1976, after a brief reprisal of Perón as president, his fourth wife became president after his death. A new military dictatorship overthrew her and waged the dirty war in which anyone who opposed them was tortured and executed. More than 25,000 people disappeared between 1976 and 1978. Every Tuesday between 1977 and 1983, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo marched around the square in front of the presidential residence in Buenos Aires. When a conflict between Margaret Thatcher's uh, British government over the Falkland Islands in 1982 led to Britain's victory and recla reclamation <laughs> of the islands, the dictatorship collapsed. Argentina had a relatively stable government and since then, but the dirty war still haunts them. The United States and the Soviet Union largely ignored Chile until Salvador Allende ran for office every six years, between 1952 and 1970. Allende believed in social equality and redistribution of wealth and was very popular in Chile. After the Castro Revolution in Cuba, the U.S. feared Chile would be the next Latin American country to become communist. So they spent lots of money to support his opposition in several elections. However, in 1970, Allende won. Allende proved to be a poor leader while he attempted to increase the demand for manufactured goods. This would stimulate industrial production. He also gave Chilean workers huge wage increases. However, it stimulated runaway inflation. In rural areas, peasants seized land from their owners, and despite Allende's calls to return them, they largely ignored him. By 1973, many workers were on strike. The military, who had originally backed him, overthrew him on September 11, 1973. This paved the way for the brutal military dictatorship of Pinochet. Although he was a horrible person, he did improve the economy by the late 1970s, but the gap between the rich and the poor widened dramatically. In 1980, Pinochet wrote a constitution that extended his presidency to 1990. However, much international pressure on his regime mounted. The U.S. continued to support him because of his anti-communist policies, but Europe and the Vatican encouraged him to step down. In 1988, Pinochet held a special election to allow him to remain in office until 1997, convinced he would win. By a 53 to 43 margin, he lost. By 2010, Chile has returned to democracy and has had a stable economy. In summary, 
Latin America's relationship with the world and the United States continues to be a tumultuous one in the 21st century. Poverty and corruption continues to be an issue in much of Latin America. The debate over immigration in the United States continues to affect millions of Latin Americans both here and abroad. Until peaceful resolution of these issues is found, this relationship will remain, in fact, tumultuous.